so we are uh, sort of halfway or more than halfway through, I guess, the, um, the indoor portion of this or the, the training part of this. But now we're going to probably jump into the nuts and bolts of probably why most of you are here. I felt like it was really important to share the background information and then all the conservation material that I did share. But now we're going to jump into... Um, you know, how do I identify a bumblebee and, and what are the, what's an introduction to the species that I'm going to see here in the Northwest or here in Idaho. And then when we're sort of done with that piece, we will jump into um, how do I participate? And many of you probably know some of the nuts and bolts, but I put together some like little short videos of how to use the online resources. And I have just sort of talked you through like how to plan a survey, how to conduct a survey. And so that's what we're going to jump into now. I anticipate this will probably take, I don't know, an hour and a half or so. Um, and then we can spend the rest of the day outside practicing what we've talked about in here. Um, I will say that it's hard to talk about identif identifying bumblebees without using um, kind of technical terms. So I'm sorry for using scientific <laughs> jargon if you're not familiar with it. I'll probably weave in and out of some of that scientific jargon. Um, but, you know, I'm really just, I, I don't anticipate that you're going to come out of this class as a bumblebee expert, right? I've been doing this for 20 years, and I'm still not really a bumblebee expert. I'm still learning all the time. So this is a real, the sort of brief introduction. And the, that guide that I printed out the, that has the different, like, red, black, and white bumblebees, that's not an authority, right? That's just what I... I find when I pick up a new taxa, whether it be birds or butterflies or flowers, like I find the guidebooks to be overwhelming. Like you just don't even know where to start in them. And so that's why I, I made that single sheet for you. I feel like it's a good starting point to then, um, you know, once you have that starting point, then you have a name that you can look up in the index and use this book, The Bumblebees of North America, which is really the comprehensive field guide. So. What I tried to do with that is just give you an entry point into what I think is a little bit more difficult of a book. So it's a little bit more of a field guide. I think you'll find it useful. Um, people in the past have found the old one that I had very useful, and I think this one's even better. So, all right. Without further ado, I'm going to get started. Um, so the first thing to know when you go to sample bumblebees, and you all know this now um, because you know about their life history, is that there are different castes of bumblebees. There are queens, there are workers, and there are males. Ross, this is an auto hiding, and I don't know why, and I feel... Alt? That didn't do anything. Yeah, I wasn't there earlier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me, let me find you. Okay. I'm sorry, I think it's just, it's enough distracting that I think we should get rid of it if we can. Is this, is this no, the there's mouse? no mouse. Oh, you there's just no use mouse. A touch pad. Okay, so let's see if this will work. Oh, you want to put it to the right? You well, were mentioning that earlier, Usually right? it will flip. flip. So, okay, so. So you put, did you check on the more? I didn't. Uh, video settings. Shoot. Okay. Yeah, let's not worry about it. Okay. But, Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for trying. All right. Well, hopefully it'll... Hi. Maybe it's because there's unread texts. Is that why maybe those orange things? No. Okay. All right. Never mind. All right. So... Because there are different casts of bumblebees, sometimes those casts will look vastly different. Queens don't necessarily have the same color patterns as the workers, and the queens and workers don't necessarily have the same color patterns as the males. Males can be very, very challenging to identify from color patterns. They vary a lot. Um, they, they vary a lot uh, is probably the easiest way to say it. And sometimes you actually even need to pull out the male genitalia, like extract it from the bumblebee to identify them to species. So color patterns are much more reliable with um, the queens and the workers. 
but it's also important to realize that color patterns are really not the best way to identify bumblebees. When taxonomists do this, they're looking at other features. And so we are looking at color patterns, but because bumblebees um, are similar to each other, they exhibit something that we call mimicry. So it, it, it benefits them to look like other species of bumblebees because then birds won't eat them. That's basically the short story of what mimicry is. So because there are a lot of look-alike species, color patterns aren't the best um, guidance, but it does, it does help. It's a good entry point. And then um, because of their life cycle, casts are active at different times of year. So queens usually come out in the spring and then we get our workers and then usually the males and there's usually a pulse of queens as well in the later fall. And so what we're trying to do when we sample is kind of hit this median worker time frame, and we're gonna encounter the workers and see them on the landscape. Okay, so this is sort of the flow chart of how like I'm a novice or I'm a new person and I see an insect on a flower and I, this is the flowchart decision tree that I think you're going to go through. The first question you're going to ask is, is this a bee or not a bee? And that, it's a harder question that I think you may, may suspect, and I'll show you some examples of that in a little bit. If you, if it's, a, if it's, obviously if it's an other, if it's not a bee, we're not talking about how to identify those today. That's a PhD dissertation for you. Um, if it is a bee, then you need to decide, do I have a bumblebee or do I have some other species of bee? And there are a couple of bee lookalikes that look like bumblebees, and I'll teach you how to do that. Um, and if it is another bee, again, I'm not teaching you how to ID those today. There's a, um, although I will share with you a resource that might be helpful if you're interested. And Bug Guide is another interesting place where you can upload photos of other bees and get experts to look at them and ID them for you. Um, it's a great resource. And then if it's a bumblebee, once you're there, the next step is you're going to try to identify whether it's a male or a female bumblebee. Um, and then once you know whether it's a male or a female, you need to ask the question, is it a citherus? And that means it's a cuckoo bumblebee. So the citherus are the cuckoo bumblebees and the non citherus are our true bumblebees or our pollen collecting bumblebees. And the same for females. Do I have a cuckoo bumblebee or do I have a true bumblebee? So that's kind of the decision tree for someone that's never done this before. And then once you're there, you can say, okay, now that I know this, I know that it's a bumblebee, that's a female, that's a true bumblebee, then you can start trying to figure out what species it is. And so now we're gonna go through sort of each of these decision points. How do I decide if it's a bee? How do I decide if it's a bumblebee or another bee? And then how do I decide if it's a male or a female? And then how do I figure out if it's a cuckoo bumblebee or a true bumblebee? What is, what is Citherus mean? What is that? It's the genus. Oh. Well, actually, it's not the genus. It used to be the genus, but now they're in the same genus as Bombus. Right. So <laughs> Citherus is now the subgenus. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I saw that. Sucklies, cuckoo bee. Right. So it's Bombus, Bombus so. Citherus, Sucklei okay. is its true, true name. So um, this question of whether it's a bee, <clears throat> bee or not, is not an easy one and it's often mistaken. These are two popular books. This is called Bees of the World and this is called The World Without Bees and that's a fly on the cover of a book called Bees of the World. Okay. Likewise, this book, A World Without Bees, that's a picture of a fly on the cover. So this is a, this is a common mistake that happens largely in communications departments of places. I'm sure that the author of that book did not choose that photo, but the publisher did, right? So this is not an easy thing. There are a lot of lookalikes, and in fact, you know, all of those pictures that you see here, while you may think they're a bee, they're not a bee. Okay, none of those are. Um, and so how do we make these decisions? What are the things that are gonna look like them, and how might we um, make that decision? So some characteristics of bees that are pretty consistent. Um, our bees, um, it, it's good to know that they did evolve from wasps, so wasps are sort of primitive bees. Um, and then it, this is a nice way to say that vegetarians are more evolved than carnivores, right? Because <laughs> bees evolved from wasps and they're vegetarians. So maybe, maybe that's where we're all headed, I don't know. Um, that was dumb. Anyway. Um, <laughs> 
They also have long tongues, so that those tongues help them to access nectar resources. Um, and then they also have, if you look somewhere on their body, because they evolved to move pollen through the landscape, as we talked earlier, if you look closely, and this is under a microscope really, you're gonna see that the hairs on their bodies are branched somewhere. And this isn't something you're gonna see while a bite bee flies by you on a flower, but um, it's just good to know that they do have um, branched hairs. And you can actually see this in the field if you're looking at a bee like in a vial. If you look through like towards the sun, you'll just see that the light quality as it comes through those hairs it just gets reflected a little bit and it kind of has a halo as opposed to just the light coming directly through those hairs. It's not something you're going to do your first time, but you know, as you get more experienced. And then most bees, or at least female bees, are going to have a scopa or a, a pollen carrying mechanism somewhere in their body. So if you see pollen um, on a body, you're, you can be pretty sure that it's a bee. Um, so bees, Characteristics again, they have four wings, so two pairs of wings. The females carry pollen. They're usually very hairy all over their bodies. And then their eyes are at the sides of their heads usually. And they also have long linear antennae. Good example here. <laughs> Flies, in contrast, have only two pairs of wings. You will, sorry, thank you. They only have one pair of wings. They only have two wings. <laughs> Um, they have little or no pollen on their bodies. It's rare to see a picture of a fly with a ton of pollen on it. They're usually not very hairy. If they have hairs, it's just separated and few. And then they usually have large bulging eyes that go out of the sides of their heads. I sort of talk about them sometimes as if they were side mirrors on a car. They stick out sort of off to the side. And you can see that a little bit um, in this photo and then this photo here. So those are those are characteristics of flies. The other thing they have is these short stubby antennae, right? So they don't have those long <coughs> linear antennae that we see on the bees. They're usually basically non-existent or these short stubby little things, um, not like bees. And then wasps are gonna be other ones that you might mistake for bees, not for bumblebees, but for bees generally. Um, because wasps are very closely related to bees, they also have two pairs of wings or four wings. Sometimes they're folded like you see here, they're kind of folded in half. They just kind of have a tougher look to them generally. They have little or no pollen on them and long skinny legs. They're usually not very hairy. And the color patterns that you see on wasps usually comes from colors on their skin. Like their exoskeleton is color patterns kind of like plates. Whereas most bees, the colors that you see actually comes from the hair. The hair is colored and not the body. That is not always true. There are exceptions to it. Um, but it, um, with wasps, especially with like stripes on the abdomen, those are usually from color patterns on the body itself. Whereas on bees, it's usually from hairs. And again, there are exceptions. Um, so again, another lookalike. This is a very close lookalike to a bumblebee. Um, but it, it doesn't have the long antennae, it doesn't have a long tongue, and it's got these short skinny skinny legs, um, nowhere to carry pollen. So those are just the, some of the things that you can see when you, when you have an animal. So there we go. That's sort of the bee or other bee. I think those are most of the animals you might mistake for a bee. <clears throat> now once I have a bee, how do I determine whether it's a bumblebee or some other species? Um, one of the groups of bees that you might confuse with bumblebees when you're first getting started are honeybees. They're in the same family. Um, one of the things that they have similar to bumblebees is a corbicula. So on their, um, and a corbicula on their hind leg, instead of being super hairy, most species of bees are just super hairy somewhere and they just stuff the pollen in those hairs. Bumblebees and honeybees have this thing called the corbicula which is basically a basket. It's a hairless area that has these long hairs surrounding it and they stuff pollen sort of in it and mix it with nectar. So you can see on honeybees and bumblebees, they carry their pollen wet. It looks like a wet globule on them. Whereas most of these other bees, here I'll go back and show you, carry the, their pollen dry. You see how dry the pollen is here? You can actually see, almost see the individual grains. With bumblebees, you, you see that orange sort of cake it kind of looks like a moist cake. 
that, that's a, a big difference between most bees and bumblebees. But honeybees also share that characteristic. So you just have to be a little bit aware as you're trying to look at honeybees and bumblebees. I honestly think that once you um, do this, you're not gonna mistake honeybees for bumblebees. I think it's pretty obvious, but it's just something to be aware of as you get started. Another interesting thing about honeybees is they have hairy eyes. They actually have hairs that come off of their eyeballs. Bumblebees don't. Um, and yeah, those are, those are, this is one group of animals you might confuse with bumblebees. Whereas bumblebees, they're gonna have large, robust bodies. Honeybees aren't that hairy. Bumblebees are very hairy all over. Their entire abdomen is covered with hair unless it's somehow been worn off. They're usually black and yellow, sometimes with orange or red. And then they have that corbicula that we talked about before. And there, there you can see another example of the, of the pollen basket and the wet, moist pollen on their legs. Um, again, another confusing, this is a fly, right? It has short, these feathery antennae. They're not long, linear antennae. There's no corbicula. Their legs are skinny. And there's just one pair of wings there. And again, these huge bulbous eyes. It's important to realize that some male bumblebees actually do have large bulbous eyes. Not all of them do, but some of them do. So you have to be careful a little bit there. Another bee that you might confuse with, um, with bumblebees are carpenter bees. And I actually, I don't, does anybody know our carpenter bees in Southern Idaho? Yes. Yeah, okay. So there are carpenter bees here. Um, and you might confuse them. They're similarly sized. They're black and yellow. Um, and th so this is what a carpenter bee looks like. The main difference are is that the, the hind leg of the carpenter bee has a scopa and not a curbicula. You can see how its hind leg is hairy here um, as opposed to having that hairless basket. Um, and also their abdomens are completely hairless. They're shiny. <laughs> You'll see the sun reflecting off of it. Um, and again, I think once you get familiar with it, you're going to notice uh, a carpenter bee versus a, 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 a bumblebee. I don't think you'd have carpenter bees in northern Idaho, probably just southern Idaho. I'm not positive about that, but um, that would be my guess. These, these species nest, these are the ones that nest sort of in the eaves of your house or in park benches. They actually chew their nest directly into hard wood. That's why they're called carpenter bees. And so here's a bumblebee next to a, um, a carpenter bee. This is a, probably not the best picture to compare them. I, I chose it because they're both in the same position, but this is a male bumblebee over here, so it doesn't have a great corbicula. You can't really see that corbicula and contrast it with the scopa here, but um, I'll, I'll show you a, a good picture of a corbicula later. They're very, very, very different. <coughs> All right, so we're at B or other B. Um, we know we've got a bumblebee, we, and now we need to decide, is it a male or a female? So how do I tell the difference? In order to tell the difference between male and females, we do need to know a little bit of anatomy, and this is where the jargon gets perhaps a little bit technical. Um, so in bees, like most insects, have three body parts. They have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. I, I hate to, to, to get too technical here, but if you're using a, a guide, like a, a key to bees that's been published, they're not going to use the word thorax and abdomen. They use the terms mesosoma and metasoma. Okay? Mesosoma is the, the thorax and metasoma is the abdomen. The reason for this is that the first segment of the abdomen on bees, like of a true insect, is actually fused on the thorax. So it's not a true thorax. So in technical literature, they use mesosoma and metasoma. Vernacular, everybody, when they talk about it, they talk about <coughs> thorax and abdomen. But when you see it in the literature, it can get confusing. So if you're starting to use a technical guide, if you start walking down that road, you should just know that those terms are out there. And then you can be familiar with it when you, when you see it. On the abdomen, on, um, there are segments called turgle segments. We're going to use those turgle segments to determine whether it's a male or a female. And the color of those turgle segments is going to help us identify species. As well as on the abdomen, there are sternal segments. So in con on, the, on the back of the bee are the turgle segments. 
On the underside of the V are the sternal segments. We're also going to look at legs to determine whether it's a male or a female, especially the hind leg. The hind leg tibia is where we would find the corbicula. Because females collect pollen and bring it back to the nests, they have a corbicula. Male bumblebees don't collect pollen. Remember, they don't contribute to the nest at all. They just leave and go about their business and try to mate. So they don't have a corbicula. They're not collecting pollen. So that's another way to tell the difference. Um, and then on the thorax is where the legs are attached and also where the wings are attached. The color patterns on the thorax can help us identify species. On the head, we're going to have the eyes. Again, sometimes males have those bulbous eyes, so the shape of the eyes can help us tell males from females. And then the, the antennae will also help us. Males have an extra segment on their antennae, so their antennae are longer than the females. Um, I don't expect that you'll be counting antennae in the field, but you'll notice that their antennae are longer when you compare them to each other. So those are sort of most of the things that you're going to look at when you're trying to figure out if it's a male or a female. Um, here's a cartoon over here. In addition, males have an extra abdominal segment. So their ab ab abdomens tend to be longer and skinnier um, and rounder, whereas the, the females, they have an ovipositor, so they sort of come down to a point and they have a stinger. So um, that's also different as well. There again, you see the 12 segments on the female antennae and then the 13 segments on the male antennae. You can see the corbicula, the triangular shaped corbicula there on the female leg and the male leg is sort of roundish. Um, other things that are, the, the, that are helpful, I think more helpful in the field than some of these things is males tend to be um, shaggy. They're not well groomed. Most female species look like they've kind of just come out of the barber and they have nice even hair. And the males tend to just look like they've got hair kind of sticking up out of everywhere and they just kind of look unkempt, kind of like us, right? So, um, so that's just something that I think you'll start to pick up, up on the field. Um, and so here are two female bees. Again, you can see that nice even hair here. You can see the pollen basket. Obviously, if it's, called, if it's carrying pollen, um, it's, it's a, definitely a female. And those thick hind legs. Um, and then for males, again, you can start to see that shaggy hair a little bit. Instead of being nice and even here, you can see hairs kind of sticking up everywhere. Um, and the, even on their legs, the kind of, it's just not as well groomed. Um, you can see the large bulbous eyes here on the Griseocolis male, um, longer antennae, skinnier legs. And here's the males again. Hopefully you can see those large bulbous eyes and a little bit of the shagginess um, of, the, of the hairs. They don't look like they've combed themselves recently. All right, so now we're down to, I know I've got a male or a female. Now I'm going to determine whether I have a cuckoo bumblebee, citrus, <laughs> or a true bumblebee. Um, non sitherous And to do that, you're going to look at the hind leg. Um, and sometimes you're going to need a hand lens to do that. Um, so I usually carry a hand lens with me out in the field for this very reason. So I'm going to show you, th these are what, these are going to compare the hind legs of the male sitherous versus the non sitherous And the bigger pictures are going to appear over here on the right. So we're going to start with the male sitherous leg. You can see that it's rounded, okay? It's not a female. I know that it's a male because it's got that sort of round shape to it, not that big triangle that we, I would see on the female. And you'll notice if you look at the entire leg that there are hairs everywhere. It's hairy basically throughout for the whole surface. There's not like a, a big hairless area. If I contrast that with a male true bumblebee, right, you see this area in the middle here where there are no hairs at all, okay? that's the true bumblebee male. It's gonna have that hairless, shiny area in the middle of that hind leg. If, this, if some of this feels like it's going over your head and it feels like it's too much for you, it's okay. We don't, you don't need to know all this information at all times. I'm just trying to give you tools. So just don't freak out. It's not gonna be this technical the whole time, I promise. <laughs> We're gonna get into pretty pictures and color patterns pretty soon but I feel like this is important information to share. 
And then this is the female um, cuckoo bumblebee leg. So it's again, it's triangular, it's wider, thicker. You can also notice that it's convex, it's rounded, and it's hairy everywhere. You can see little hair pores coming out of every surface on that tibial segment. And if I contrast that with the curbicula, you can see it's still triangular, but now we're concave, right? And there are no hairs in the middle of it. It just has these long, what we call corbicular fringe hairs on the outside. And that's the basket where she grooms all of her pollen into. Is that at least somewhat clear? Yeah? Clear as mud? Good. All right. So that's, that's sort of it. Once you're there, now we can start looking at color patterns to try to decide what species that we have. Um, to do that, we're going to look at color patterns on the head, we're going to look at color patterns on the thorax, and we're going to look at color patterns on the abdomen. Occasionally, we're going to look at the face and some features on the face to help us determine between two different species if they have the same color patterns. What are some things that I want to look at? You'll hear me referring regularly today to cheek length. How long is the cheek in a bee? And that is the space between the bottom of the eye and the mandibular hinges. Okay, that's called the malar space in a bee and it's referred to as cheek length. Some bees have long cheeks. This bee has a long cheek and it has what I kind of call a horse face. It has a kind of a long look to it. There are other bees that basically have no cheek at all and the mandibular hinge is way up here. And so their face is short and round. And that's going to be, you don't actually have to measure the, the cheek length, but almost just looking at the shape of their face. Is it a long horse face or is it a short round face? And it is something that will come with experience. And again, being able to count those antennal segments, if you have a specimen, can be helpful. Occasionally, if you get into technical keys, they might start talking about ocelli. And these are eyes on the top of the bee's head. They're, they're light gathering eyes. They're not seeing motion. Um, but whether they're at or above the supraorbital line, which is the line between the top of the two of the compound eyes here, whether these are below, at, or above that can also help you decide some species. And again, this is only if you're getting into some of the technical keys this isn't stuff you're going to be doing out in the field, but we're here. We may as well mention it. Hey, Rich. Yes, sir. Could you use the mouse cursor to point some people online to see what features you're talking about? If it works. Sure. Sure. I'd be happy to. <clears throat> um, I don't. Oh, I do have one. Okay. It's just a little hard because I don't have a mouse. I only have a touchpad, but I will try to do that. Thanks for the reminder. All right, so here this is, this is uh, again, looking at just a closer investigation of cheek length. You can see here this bee on the left has a long cheek. And what we're really looking at is the ratio of the distance between the eye and these hinges to the width of the hinges. And you can see this bee, the length here is quite a bit longer than the width. Okay, whereas over here on this bee, the length from here to here, right, is about the same or less than the width. Okay, so short cheek, long cheek. And again, that's just looking at the malar space. If we look at these bees from the front, and I'll show you pictures later in the presentation, you'll see that sort of horse look versus that rounded short face look. Um, and again, sometimes in the technical keys, you'll see a reference to the color of the corbicular fringe. Sometimes the hairs on the hind leg of the bumblebees are different colors, <coughs> orange versus rust versus black. That can help you determine different species with similar color patterns. Um, and then, you know, the main thing that we're going to be using is just looking at color patterns. What colors are the different parts of their bodies? And so that's mostly what we're going to focus on for the rest of the talk or as I introduce you to all the species in the Northwest, and we'll, um, we will, uh, I'll share some information about cheek length as well, but a lot of that other technical stuff we will now leave behind and we'll be talking mostly about color patterns. And they are pretty helpful. Just so you know, there's really two main resources if you wanna have a field guide. The book I mentioned earlier, Bumblebees of North America, it's a great book from Princeton University Press. 
And then this book on the left, this was a guide that was put out by the Pollinator Partnership and the, for and the Forest Service. Um, it's called Bumblebees of the Western United States. You can't get a print copy anymore, it's out of print, but it is available as a free PDF. You can just download it and use it. Um, some of the taxonomy is different between these two books. Um, some species have been updated. This book, the Bumblebees of North America book, has the most recent relevant taxonomy. The changes aren't that significant but there is some differences. And the species names that I'm using follow this book and not this book. So there's a couple species that, might, that you might misname if you're using this book, but I think you'll be able to figure it out and I'll try to point that out when we get to those species if that's helpful. I can't promise I'll remember, but I'll try. All right, now I'm gonna introduce you to the individual species. And I'm more or less gonna do this using the, um, the guide that I put together there. So I'm, I've grouped these largely into what I call striped bees, red bees, white bees, and black-tailed bees. And we're gonna, gonna kinda go through them in a group-like fashion. We're gonna start with the red group or the red-tailed group. These are all bees that have red somewhere on their body. The five that I'm showing here are gonna be the five most common red-tailed bumblebees. There are others, those sort of get honorable mention, and I'll mention those um, after I introduce you to these five, because I think these are the five that you're most likely to encounter. We're gonna go species by species. I'm gonna show you the features that I use to identify them out in the field and the key things that I'm looking in on. This is Bombus melanopygus, or mel melanopagus, depending on who you talk to. Um, this species is one of our first emerging species. It's out, one of the first bees out in the spring. Um, <clears throat> one of the key things and features that I key in on with this species is something that we refer to sort of with bumblebees as cloudy coloration. And cloudy coloration comes from a mix of yellow and black hairs. If you notice the contrast between the back of the thorax on this bee where it's bright yellow and the front where it kind of looks gray. That's because there's no black hairs mixed in here, but there are lots of black hairs mixed with the yellow hairs in here. So those cloudy like appearance is something that I key in with this species. A close lookalike is Bombus huntii, which is super common around here. And it is not cloudy at all. It has bright yellow everywhere. And so it's a big, big contrast. The other main thing is on, what I call T5, these segments on the turgles are numbered, one, two, three, four, five, six on females. You can notice if you look at the fourth turgle segment that there's yellow there, but it's not a bright, solid yellow color pattern. It's kind of a thin, almost gray line that's written there. And that's also very different from the other species um, that, are, that have red tails. This is the distribution of that species. So you can see it's pretty broadly distributed throughout the Pacific Northwest. It's not that frequent here in Southern Idaho, but the, the further up into Northern Idaho you get into the mountains, the more you're gonna encounter this species. This is Bombus centralis, um, next species. Um, in contrast to this one, you'll notice there's no cloudy appearance on its abdomen or I'm on its thorax, the front of its thorax has that bright yellow coloration on the front here, no blacks inter black intermixing, same thing on the back. And then with Bombus melanopagus or melanopygus, it went yellow, red, red, yellow. This species on its abdomen goes yellow, yellow, red, red. Okay, so the, the, the pattern is a little bit different. Hey Ross, yeah. could you fill this with water for me? Sure. Forgot to refill it at lunch. Been talking too much. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and it also has that solid black band between the wings there, which is pretty consistent. One of the things that I, that's also worth noticing, if we go back and look here at Bombus melanopygus, some of these species, even within the species, are highly variable, right? They have differences in them. So um, it's worth uh, just <coughs> noting that some species are more variable than others. 
These ones that you see over here on the right hand side for Bombus melanopigus. Sorry to go back and forth, but I forgot to mention this. These are from like Southern Oregon and California. They have no red on them. So if you're watching the webinar from Southern Oregon, this is what Bombus melanopigus looks like in your region. It's over here on the right with no, no red. But up here in Idaho and throughout most of Oregon and most of Washington, they are going to have red on them. Bombus centralis, in contrast, is pretty consistent in coloration. It's going to look similar almost anywhere that you find it. Um, again, it's broadly distributed throughout the region, not regularly found west of the Cascades, but certainly throughout all of Idaho, um, you'd see this. We saw this species a few times yesterday, not far from Boise here. Um, this is Bombus mixtus. Um, thank you so much. Appreciate that. This is um, in contrast to Centralis and Melanopigus. This one is gonna have some of the cloudy appearance on the thorax, so it has those black hairs intermixed throughout, both on the front and the back. But this species, instead of going yellow and then red, this species actually goes yellow, yellow, black, red. So this actually truly has a, a red tail. I think this is, unless you get up to really high elevations, this is the only species that you're gonna encounter that's gonna have red basically on its butt. Most species end in yellow or black. This species ends in red, and this is the only one that you're gonna encounter that has that red butt. And I should also say, I think I've said this enough, but there are in, there's just enough individual variation within species that there's gonna be exceptions, right? You're gonna run into weird stuff. So I'm not like speaking actual gospel up here. It's just, you know, just guidelines. But, but mostly this is gonna be the only species you're gonna see with red on its butt. And you can see that throughout. Sometimes the red, particularly as the season goes on, will fade to a pale brown, so it's, or even almost a yellow. But it's still, it goes all the way to the, to the end of its abdomen, which is unique. The cloudy appearance. So here, Bombus mixtus looks a lot like Bombus sitkensis, which is another species that you guys won't encounter here in Idaho. And this is one of the ones where we would use cheek length. So you can see Bombus mixtus is over here on the right. It has a very short cheek. You can see the space here is short. But you also notice just how kind of round its face looks like. And we contrast that to Sitkensis, which has a longer cheek. And then with Flavifrons, which has an even longer cheek. So sort of medium cheek, not quite a horse, but maybe a mule. I don't know. I don't know my, <laughs> my mammals that well. But, and then we get over here to Flavifrons, which has a really long cheek. And it has that kind of long snout-like look to it. You can start to see sort of the roundness over here and the long sort of rectangular shape over here. And this species is intermediate. Distribution of Bombus mixtus is all throughout the region. This species can be very, very abundant. It's also sometimes very, very small. So you got to be careful when you're out there and make sure you're looking at um, some of the smaller flowers when you look for this bee. Next species is Bombus rufocinctus. This one has, um, you know, to be honest with you, when looking at just my vast Idaho bumblebeeing experience, which consists of a day and a half now, I've not seen the species with red on it here in Idaho. I've only seen it in a specimen from over here, and the, everything one I saw yesterday did not have red. They all had black. But this is the most variable species in North America. It has more color patterns than any other species. If you take a look at the number up here, there's, I don't know what, we have seven different queen color patterns, seven different worker color patterns, and seven different male color patterns. And this doesn't even begin to cover all of them, right? This is only some of them. So hugely variable species. The one thing I key into with color pattern-wise with this one is that crescent of yellow that you see on that second abdominal segment. So you can see it's mostly red, but there's this crescent of yellow that comes down. And you can see that crescent of yellow across its different um, variations, including the ones that don't have red on them, right? They often have this little crescent of yellow that comes down and just key, that's pretty unique for the species. So that's the one thing that I key into. What you will, once you get experienced enough for this, one of the things that you're gonna figure out with Rufus is you're gonna look at it and you're gonna say, I don't know what that is. 
oh, it's Rufus Thinktus. <laughs> and that's often what you'll, what you'll figure out. Or it's a male, which is another um, option. But this one's hard. This is a hard species to ID just because it's so variable. Rufus Synctus has a very, very short face as well. So if you're confused as it might be one species or another, this one is very short and round. It virtually has no space here between its eye um, and its hinges. And again, you can't quite see it, but it's a very, again, round face as opposed to that longer face to it. Rufus Synctus is broadly distributed across North America um, and can be quite common. Bombus huntii is the next one. This species has almost no variation in its color patterns. You can see there's just two shown over here, the queen and the worker, and they're virtually identical. This bee always looks the same. It also always looks just like that. I mean, <laughs> it is always well-groomed. It looks like it just came out of the salon. The color patterns, the, color, the hairs are short and even, and it has that sort of yellow, black, yellow, yellow, red, red, yellow color pattern. It's very consistent. This species is probably the most abundant species you have in this part of Idaho. Um, if you're watching this from Western Washington or Western Oregon, you won't see this species really at all. Um, this is an east side species, east side of the Cascades. So we're also gonna focus on that black band between the wings and then the yellow, red, red, yellow, and in contrast to Melanopigus that we talked about earlier, that fourth abdominal segment there is bright yellow, right? The whole thing is bright yellow as opposed to just a thin line or a grayness to it. It's very bright yellow. And this can be very broadly distributed throughout much of the West, especially east of the Cascades. All right, so now I'm gonna quiz you. Um, these are the, the four most common reds you're going to encounter. We'll start here in the lower left-hand corner. Who can tell me what species that is? Yeah, good, that's Huntii. This is the only species that has red basically all the way to its butt. Rufosync, no, mix this, yep. And then we have the yellow, red, red with thin yellow line on T4 there. That's Melanopigus or Melanopagus. Um, and it's got the cloudiness up here. You see the front of its Thorax is kind of cloudy rather than the bright yellow that we see over here on Huntii. Then we have this species which has the crescent of yellow on T2. That's Rufus cinctus. And then here we have the, on the abdomen, yellow, yellow, red, red. That's the Centralis. Centralis is also very small bodied, usually. So those are your most common red species or species you're gonna find with red. Um, and then these are the other ones that you might encounter with red on them. So the, the more east you get and the higher in elevation you get, Bombus bifarius will often have um, red on it. The high, if you're at very high elevation, like the highest of elevations here in Idaho, you may encounter Bombus silvicola, which um, looks a lot like Bombus huntii. It has longer hairs. Um, and is, it is going to be found at higher elevation where you probably wouldn't find Bombus um, huntii. Bombus flavifrons is another one. Usually I see this without red, but the further east you go in our region, the more likely you are to see it with red. It also has red on it in the um, San Juan Islands of Washington for some reason. There's a group there that has red on its tail. Same with Bifarius. Bifarius also has a little group on the San Juan Islands that has red on it. So if you're watching from those areas, beware of that. These are gonna have, these are less common than, um, than the ones I've already shared with you. This is a picture of Bombus Bifarius from Washington State. You can see they sometimes do have red on it. This is a picture of Bombus flavifrons from the San Juan Islands. You can see it still has that cloudy, I actually haven't introduced you to Bombus flavifrons yet, but this is a normally a black-tailed bumblebee, but it has that cloudy thorax and similar color pattern to Centralis. So that's how I would tell the difference between this species and Centralis. It's got yellow, yellow, red, red, but Centralis has those that solid yellow on the thorax, whereas flavifrons has that cloudy appearance. You having fun yet? <laughs> It's easy, right? 
And this is Bombus silvicola, which again looks a lot like Huntii, except it also has yellow down here on T5. And you can see instead of looking really well groomed, it kind of has longer hairs to it, um, in contrast to that picture I showed you of Huntii a minute ago. Yes, question. So you mentioned that one of them was small body. Is there, because they change in size over the season, is that why you don't have a size P for yep. these? Okay. Yeah. But are there, I mean. If you look in like this book, Bumblebees of North America, there are, they tell you the size variation of the queens, workers, and males. So it's in there. Yeah. It's also can be relative, so. Yes. Um, you haven't mentioned the black uh, area on the thorax much. Are, are those pretty indistinct? Or when you look at the rufocinctus, can you see that it's a little pinky dot? You know, so, so remember that I'm on, on the gray sheet that you have there in front of you, or that you maybe downloaded, that's just one color pattern, right? So I'm just showing you one color pattern. Remember that rufocinctus has 21 different color patterns. Sometimes it's a dot on the thorax. Sometimes it's a, a black band between the wings. How consistent that is varies between species. Well, on that Bifarius, did that uh, little stem-like black extension always show? It does, yeah. uh, yes. And I, when I introduce you to Bifarius, Formally, when I get to the striped group, I'll share that with you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so those are the other ones. Just to, to show you a little bit uh, of what their distribution might look like, I don't have it for flavifrons, but for silvicola, again, you can, you're only gonna see this at some of the higher elevations um, in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. It's not very common um, in the lowlands. It's a really a high elevation species. This is a color pattern chart ge geographically for Bifarious. So you can see it's really only along the mountain spine that we're going to see it with red on it, where throughout most of the region it's going to be black. And then Flavifrons again has a similar color pattern here to um, Bifarious, although the red s goes further to the west than it does with Bifarious. What do you consider high elevation? I assume that varies with latitude. Not too much with latitude, but like Silvicola, probably 5,000 feet, I would say, above 5,000 feet, above 6,000 feet. The next group we're going to talk about is the striped group. Um, this group's complicated because there are many, many, this is one of those mimicry groups where there are lots of lookalikes. So I'm going to introduce you to the most common, and I'll be honest with you that here in Idaho, Two of these species don't even apply to you. You don't have to think about them at all because they're, they're really only west side of the Cascade uh, species. <clears throat> the first one's Bom Bombus bifarius. Um, again, that notch that was mentioned before on the thorax be between the wings, right behind the wings, that triangular notch is really something you can key in on with them, as well as with the color pattern on the thorax. You're going to get yellow, black, black, yellow on the thorax, which is is pretty unique, but that notch in behind the wings there, that's something that's very worth keying in on and something that's very obvious in the field and isn't shared by many other species in the West. This species can be very, very abundant. It can also be very, very small so and fast. Um, so, so it can be a tough one to catch. Um, Bombus fervidus is the next one. Um, you notice that I'm sharing with you the color pattern here of sort of being a striped bumblebee. As we get into Idaho, um, this species doesn't, isn't often striped. This species used to be called Bombus californicus. And in fact, if you use that Western guide that I mentioned earlier, it's still separated and called Bombus californicus in that book. They've been synonymized, so it's the same species. Um, so it's Bombus fervidus now. This species is going to have yellow um, on, here in Idaho, it's going to have yellow on all the first four abdominal segments, and then black on the fifth one. In Oregon and Washington, particularly in Oregon, in Western Oregon and Washington, it's going to have yellow on the front of the thorax, and then be black all the way to that yellow stripe on the fourth abdominal segment. This species is also the longest tongue <coughs> species in our region, so it has the longest cheek. This is the most horse-like bee that you're going to find. 
most horse-like bee you're going to find. <laughs> That's a good one. But yeah, it also has a black face. So we're going to separate it from our, some of our other ones by that black face. Um, and this species can be quite common. It's distributed pretty much throughout all of North America. <clears throat> the species is of conservation concern. Most of that conservation concern is actually due to declines in the east. It seems to be doing better here in the west. Bombus vasnesenskii, this is probably the most common bumblebee west of the Cascades. Um, it has a short, even hair, um, and then it's yellow face, yellow on the front of the thorax, and then black all the way to that fourth abdominal stripe. This looks a lot like Bombus fervidus. The difference is that Bombus fervidus has a black face, Bombus vasnesenskii has a yellow face. Bombus vasnesenskii, as I mentioned, broadly distributed, very common west of the Cascades. Um, so that is the majority of the striped group. Um, again, we focus here with your little quiz. Uh, we have the notch um, on the back of the thorax. That's Bombus black face, yellow stripe. Fervidus, and then yellow face, yellow stripe is Vosnesenskii. Um, very good. There are a bunch of honorable mentions here that are also true bumblebees, or, or actually two of them are cuckoo bumblebees, which is why they're not necessarily in that group that are also striped and sometimes have a notch. This is one of the reasons it's important to determine whether you have a cuckoo bumblebee or not before you start determining species. So these two species, Bombus insularis, and Bombus sucklii. They're close lookalikes to Bombus bifarius and Bombus vasnesenskii, but they're cuckoo, so you should have separated that before you started looking at their color patterns by looking at those hind legs. Okay, so that's important to think about. Bombus vasnesenskii also has very close lookalikes. Bombus collagenosus looks virtually identical to Bombus vasnesenskii, yellow face, yellow stripe on T4. And these species overlap in their ranges. The way to tell the difference between them, I will go over um, towards the end of this presentation. And then Van Dykei, um, which, which is a little less common than either of those two species, has its yellow stripe on T3 rather than on T4. Okay, so these are the sort of less common striped bumblebees, but still you're, you could run into them. The next group is the black-tailed group. <clears throat> starting with Bombus flavifrons. So you, this is again another long-tongued or long-cheeked species. It's got the gray hairs on the thorax and the pattern on the abdomen goes yellow, yellow, black, black, black. <clears throat> this is the species I mentioned earlier, but the further east you go, the more likely it is to have red on it. So you can see that cloudy hair um, in the keys and the color pattern keys over here and then the black at the back. This species is also quite common, locally common, and can be small bodied and fast as well. Remember I mentioned this species earlier when I was contrasting it with Bombus mixtus. This has the very, very long cheek, and mixtus has the very, very short cheek with Sitkensis, the in-between of the two. Bombus vegans is the next uh, species we're gonna talk about. This species is also very small bodied, um, also generally bright yellow. Um, and this one does regularly have that black circle on its thorax that you see here. That's a pretty reliable key for this species. You can see that there. Um, and this species, like flavifrons, is gonna have yellow on the first two segments of its abdomen, but its, its thorax is not cloudy, right? It has that bright yellow coloration on its thorax instead of the grayness. Uh, this species is, is, is not very common in Washington and Oregon, very, very rare, um, more common in Northern Idaho, but not in this part of the state that has been detected yet. But you guys might help change that. Yes? Is the flag, is it F-O-N-S or F-R-O-N-S? It's F-R-O-N-S, sorry if I spelled it wrong. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Flavifrons. Which one is it spelled wrong on, the new one? The new one, yeah, under black, yeah. yeah. Sorry, it's Franz. Yes. That's my fault. So sometimes they have red. Sometimes they have red. 
The, the okay. further east yeah. you go, the more likely you are to get red. Okay, that's why you have it in two. Yep. Guess right. Yep. I think it has an east and a west icon underneath the red and the black one there. It should. Anyway. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Griseocolis is the next one. This is a common sight. You'll probably see this summer as a crab spider with a with a bumblebee in its jaws. Um, but it's a good picture of Bombus griseocolis. <laughs> this is called the, the the common name is the brown belted bumblebee. It has a, a crescent of brown um, hair on its second abdominal segment. So it looks a little bit like Vegans. Um, it's got the black dot sometimes on the thorax there. But instead of having a solid yellow band on T2, it's going to have a crescent, <coughs> usually of brown, although sometimes of yellow there on T2. This is a, a in contrast also with Bombus Vegans, this is a big bee, um, big bodied bee. Uh, this species isn't terribly common in the West, but it, it seems to be becoming more abundant in my, the field work I've been doing for the last many years. I seem to be encountering this species more and more and more. It seems to be increasing in my personal experience. The next species is Bombus nevidensis. This is a very large bodied species. We saw queens yesterday that were, I don't know, an inch and a half, close to two inches, really, really big, really big bees. These are also gonna have a black dot on the thorax in between the wings. And this, the first three abdominal segments are gonna be yellow. So you're usually gonna see yellow, yellow, yellow um, on its ab abdomen. And this has a black face as well as a black vertex. I haven't talked about the vertex yet. So there's really two patterns that you'll see on the head the face, which you see here, and then this little crescent of, on the top of its head is called the vertex. On this species, the vertex is usually black, and you can see that sort of here on the top of the head as a black vertex. Uh, its lookalike species is Bombus morrisoni, which is of conservation concern, has a yellow vertex, and that's how we're gonna tell the difference between those two, because their color patterns are very similar. Bombus nevidensis can be locally quite common. It doesn't look like it based on the dots on this map, but I think it was the most common bumblebee we saw yesterday. Bombus morrisoni is a very close lookalike to Bombus ne um, nevidensis. Has very similar color patterns, except it instead of having a solid third yellow segment, it's gonna have that crescent, sort of that half moon instead of a solid segment. And this species has a yellow crescent on the top of its head, or that vertex is yellow in this species. And you can see that tuft of hair right here. That's the vertex, and it's bright yellow here as opposed to black like it was on Nevidensis. And there's no dot. It's a solid yellow on the thorax. This species seems to have vastly decreased from much of its range, although I just saw a specimen from here in Boise, so from last year, right? It was from 2017. So, um, so you guys might help us find new information about the species. And there's no dots in this map near Bunt Bend, Oregon, and we've had citizen scientists find it within the last year in Central Oregon, too. So, um, you know, our, inf our, our information about the species may dramatically change with more people and the drier, less populated parts of the country looking for it, which is great. So that's our black-tailed group. Starting here on the left, we've got a bright yellow thorax with the first two segments uh, on the abdomen yellow. Bombus vegans, good. Here we've got a black vertex, a black dot on the thorax, and the first three segments in the abdomen are yellow. Nevidensis. Then we have basically no dot. We have a yellow vertex and that crescent of yellow on T3. Morrisoni. Close look alike to Vegans here, but we have a cloudy thorax. Flava fronds. And then the brown crescent on T2 is Griseocolis. Good. So our honorable mentions here are going to be Bombus mixtus. I mentioned earlier that sometimes the, the red uh, on the back of the abdomen sometimes fades to pale yellow or pale white. Um, sometimes the, the red can actually be 
just on the very bottom of T5 here, and it looks like a black-tailed bumblebee. So, so be careful when you're, when you're looking, if you've called it a black-tailed bumblebee, be sure to eliminate Bombus mixtus. And same with Sitkensis. It actually has, usually has pale white. Um, I haven't introduced you to this species yet. It usually has pale white at the back of its abdomen. Sometimes that white fades to almost black. So just be careful um, with those two species. <clears throat> this is what Bombus Sitkensis looks like. Um, so you can see it looks a lot like Flavifrons. It's got that cloudy thorax here. The first two segments are yellow but you can see that pale sort of brown whitish hair towards the tip of its abdomen. And to be fair, this species is really a coastal species, so not something you guys need to think about here in Boise. It's more of a Washington and Idaho, Washington and Oregon um, species. The not so honorable mention here is, um, is Bombus impatiens. And I say not so honorable mention here because this is not a native species to the Western United States. But this is the species that's commercially available. It has escaped from greenhouses and it is established in British Columbia. And there are records in Washington. So it's coming. And so be on the lookout for this species. We obviously want to be able to track it as it expands and be able to measure how it affects the native species as it starts interacting with them. So just be aware that this is out there. It is listed on your sheet there with a little conservation concern icon next to it. Is it a native to species? Yes, it's native basically everywhere east of the Rockies. Um, and it's the conservation concern icon that you see on that form is not because it's in trouble, but because we're tracking it from a conservation perspective. It's doing just fine population-wise. Yeah. <laughs> That's a picture of Bombus impatiens. This is a, this picture is actually taken from Washington State. This is the far northern, um, basically right on the border of uh, Washington and British Columbia. But this one just has yellow on the first abdominal segment, and the rest is black. And there's no species native to the west that would look like that. Another good picture of the corbicula on this bee here. You can see that triangular shaped hairless area. These are the records from, from British Columbia. You can see it's pretty well established. These are all from Bumblebee Watch. And for some reason, this record here from Blaine, that's actually in the United States. So that photo is taken from in Blaine. But when it displays on the map, until you zoom way in, it looks like it's on the Canadian side. But that's actually in Washington. So species we need to be watching out for. The next groups are, the, is, are what we call, the, what I'm calling the whites. Um, but, uh, I guess I'll, instead of telling you now, I'll go through them. Uh, the first is Bombus appositus. This is the only one that has white on its thorax. The other two have white on their abdomen. Um, this species is very big bodied. It also tends to be sort of orangish, as you see here, um, as opposed to yellow. Um, so it has white here at the front of its thorax. It's called the, the common name for this bee is the white-shouldered bumblebee because it kind of looks like it has white shoulders, I guess. Um, this can be quite common. This picture is actually taken from Zumwalt Prairie in Northeast Oregon. It can be very common in this part, in drier parts of the, of the region. This is Bombus occidentalis, again, the western bumblebee. This is one of our SGCNs. Um, this species has bright white, and like I really mean snow white, like the color of paper white on the back of its abdomen, and there's really no other species that has that. It's very, very distinct. The closer you get to the Rockies, so the more east and not eastern and northern Idaho, you might encounter this color form up here. It actually has, also has a yellow stripe on T3, but it's also going to have the bright white uh, on, on T5. And when I say white, I like mean it's white. You're not going to confuse it. These, these color patterns that you see here that are more yellowish, these are actually found on the coast of California. So you're not going to encounter those color patterns here. The ones you're going to see here are, are going to be bright, bright white. And again, this is, used to be quite common, probably one of the top three most common bumblebees in the West. And it's now dropped to you know, a very, very uncommon species. It is much more common in the Intermountain West. 
than it is west of the Cascades where it's vir virtually absent. And then Bombus franklii, you wouldn't see it in Idaho, you wouldn't see it in Washington. It was native basically from Ashland to Redding, California. It had the most narrow range of any species of bumblebee in the world. Um, and again, this is the one that hasn't been seen since 2006. But if, you're, if you get the bumblebee watching bug and want to travel to Southern Oregon to try to look for it, the Fish and Wildlife Service actually, along with Robin Thorpe, runs annual citizen science surveys where they invite people to come for a week and they go out to historic sites and look for this bumblebee and they're always trying to recruit citizen scientists. So if you want to travel and go look for this bee and other bees, you know, you should keep your eye out for that. I think the Fish and Wildlife Service regularly advertises for that. I haven't seen the advertisement yet for this year, but I assume it's going to happen. And its range is hard to show on a map because it's so small, um, but you can see the little square around uh, Southern Oregon, Northern California there. This is the California border that you see going kind of across the middle of that map. Should that be west of I-5? Uh, I-5 kind of goes right down the center so of this. So it's kind of east? Okay. Yep. I-5 would kind of go right here. Okay. Like this is Mount Ashland right, right in here, I think, yeah. So those are the whites, um, the western bumblebee on the left, the white-shouldered bumblebee in the middle, Bombus positus, and then Bombus franklini on the right. Um, all sort of more western coastal species. Um, and then, so now to really confuse you, I'm going to go back to this yellow-faced group and talk a little bit more about how to identify them. I'm sorry to do this in Idaho um, because it's really not terribly relevant. Although one of the things we are hoping is that people will travel during this project. So you don't have to do this in your backyard. You're welcome to come to Washington and Oregon and sample bumblebees as well. Um, but for the folks that are watching on the webinar, I feel like it is important to talk about these species. So how do I tell Bombus vazdesenskii, which is the species here on the right, and the most common yellow-faced, yellow-striped bumblebee from these other two, Bombus van dykii and Bombus collagenosus. They all have the same range. They look virtually identical to each other. And so how do we tell the difference? This is one of those mimicry groups. It is possible, it's not impossible to tell the difference between these two. Particularly with Bombus collagenosus, this is gonna have, um, Bombus vazosinski I mentioned earlier has very even hairs. Bombus collagenosus kind of looks like a male. They've got a little bit longer hairs. It's a little less unkempt. But most importantly, this one has yellow on its sternal segments. So the underside of its abdomen has yellow hairs on it. The backside looks the same, but the underside has yellow on it. Whereas with Vazosenskii, it's going to be all black. There's going to be no yellow hairs there. Van Dykia is the same. It also has yellow on the underside of its abdomen but it doesn't have its stripe here on T4, it has its stripe on T3, so it's further up the abdomen. And then Vazosinski eye, it's gonna have that black belly, the black sternal segments, and then um, very even short hair. So here are those three species in sort of all, they're all there, right? And so how do we tell them when we look at them? And obviously this is a situation where we have them on a pin, and we can start looking at them. Um, so we're gonna start and look at these one by one. So if we zoom in on this one, okay, one of the things to notice first when I look at this photo is it looks a little shaggy. You notice how there's hair sticking up everywhere. It kind of looks like your husband who didn't comb his hair this morning. Um, um, so just those hairs sticking out a little bit. The other thing to notice here, we have the yellow stripe that's pretty far down on the abdomen. You can't see the individual abdominal segments, but it looks like it's on four rather than on three. And then if you notice on the underside of the abdomen, can you see those yellow hairs there? Okay, so that's, that's what we need. And so when you're documenting this species and taking photos of it, we really need a photo of the underside of the abdomen for the yellow-faced, yellow-striped bumblebees we need to be able to see the sternal segments. This is Bombus collagenosus. Is there a way to photograph that without uh, killing it? Yeah, so one of the techniques we'll share with you when we get there, um, oh shoot, we're running short on time here, but um, 
Yeah, we'll get there. Okay. Yep, for okay. sure. Um, the next one, if we zoom in on it here, you'll notice pretty even hair compared to the last one. It also has that yellow stripe really far down on the abdomen, but the underside of the abdomen is all black. Okay, so this is Bombus vaslicinskia. Short, even hair, black belly. And then this one also has kind of shaggy hair, but in addition, you can tell, especially here on the abdomen, that the hair is longer. Okay, do you see that long hair? It kind of almost looks like it's folded over a little bit. Um, this one also, it's, it's hard to tell greatly, but the yellow stripe is actually a little bit higher on the abdomen here. So this is on T3. This is Bombus van Dykei. Also has a little bit of yellow here on the sternal segments. <coughs> And then this one shows, I think, the stripe being on T3 just a little bit better. So this is T4 here, and this is T5 here. This is also Bombus van Dykei. Longer hair. Okay, so this is a tough species group. We need clear photos with this one when you're documenting it. Um, to confuse you even further, Bombus van Dykei <laughs> also has a totally different color pattern that's found kind of in north central Washington, near Wenatchee, sort of up in that area. And its color pattern looks like this specimen right here. It also has that yellow stripe on T3, but also some on T2 and some on T1 and some on the thorax too. So, yeah, everything goes. This is pretty, this, the distribution of this particular color pattern is, is pretty narrow though. It's around Wenatchee, Washington, and down near Ashland, Oregon. Everywhere else it has that other color pattern that I shared with you. The other difficult group you're gonna come across are our cuckoo bees, okay? Um, Bombus flavidus, um, and, and another difference between, remember earlier I mentioned the taxonomy was different with that Western group versus the new book. Bombus flavidus is called Bombus fernalde in that book, in the Western book. So Bombus flavidus is the new name. But again, these all have similar color patterns. They all have similar distributions. The key thing here is you want to look at that leg, right? We want to know that it's cuckoo bee, and then we can start trying to figure out what species it is. Yes? So the picture um, here yep. doesn't match the one on the right, the there, yeah. Here. What a shame. That's too bad. Um, that's my fault again. I will fix it and put an updated one on the website, um, and you can download a new one. The one up here is right. This is right for sure. Yep. I will fix it and put a new one on the website tonight. Like I said, I just put that together for this, but that's a, that's a significant error. Thank you for being my guinea pigs. <laughs> so with Bombus flavidus, again, the hind leg has no curricula, has a black face, has yellow on T4, and the hair tends to be long and uneven. This can look a lot like Bombus fervidus. Bombus insularis is gonna have a, a yellow face, although it's not an all yellow face, it's really just the upper half of its face is yellow and the lower half is black, but it looks a lot like Bombus vazosinskii and all those other yellow face bees. And then Bombus succlii is going to have a black face um, and it has that notch kind of like Bombus bifarius, okay, on its thorax there. So again, here's all three of those species. And then there's one thrown in here that doesn't belong. Who can tell me which one doesn't belong and why? The one in. Oh, it's the one at the upper right because it has some. Um, it's not a cuckoo. That's right. This one in the upper right here, you see the corbicula? You see how it's different from the other three? Okay, so this is a true bumblebee. This is actually Bombus collagenosus. We looked at it just a minute ago, okay? So that one doesn't belong. Okay, this one here. You can see that it has yellow in the top half of its face, okay? And then yellow and then a yellow stripe on T4 and a little bit on T5. This is Bombus insularis. This one has a black face 
Um, the other thing to notice about this one is that it has, can you tell how its abdomen is strongly recurved under its body like this? And how the tip of its abdomen is basically pointing towards its head? That is a diagnostic feature for this species, that sort of hook that you see there. It will look like that in the field. That's not because it's dead and on a pin. It actually truly looks like that. And you know, these are species, remember, that they've got to go in and attack as soon as they get in. So I think that's probably an armored, helping them to sting the bee that's under them kind of feature. That's why it looks like this. This is Bombus flavidus. And then this is, um, again, the black face. Much of the thorax is yellow. And then we, we've got that notch at the back of the thorax there and then the yellow stripes. So this is Bombus succlei. This is our SGCN bumblebee. And again, I really apologize for that ID guide. That's a, a silly error that I should not have made. What's SGN again? Species of greatest conservation need. So there's all the bumblebees of the West. That's every species, um, probably except for um, um, one species I didn't put on here is Bombus frigidus, which is another super high elevation species that looks a lot like Bombus mixtus. Um, but again, what I've tried to do is take all of these many species you might encounter and break them up into color pattern groups. So we have our red group, our striped group, and our black-tailed group. And hopefully that helps you make sense of, of what you're going to find out there. Um, and then we have our white group. And hopefully this, this guide helps you out. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at my air here as I look at this. Where's the other? The these the names on these two are switched. Oh, switched. Okay. Yep. So I've tried to indicate. So the mountain here means species that you'd find at higher elevation. Okay, so Silvicola, um, the black and the yellow color forms of Silvicola and Bifarius, you're going to find the red Bifarius, you're going to find at higher elevations. And then the concern in this. So, so again, I hope that this ends up being a, um, an entry point, right? This gets you to the book. The book will help you put the name on it. That's all I'm trying to do with what I just shared with you. Fervidus? Frigidus. Oh, it would be red-tailed. It looks a lot like Bombus mixtus. It's almost identical to Bombus mixtus. So that's easy, right? You guys got this? No problem?